So let me uh, complete this correspondence that I uh, promised to bring out between the group of rotations in three dimensions and a certain group of 2 by 2 matrices called SU2 and the correspondence goes as follows. You recall yesterday we got to a stage where we recognize that a rotation about some direction specified by the unit vector n through an angle psi led to a parameter space the two polar angles specifying n and the angle psi which was not simply connected. This parameter space in fact was doubly connected and there were two classes of closed paths in this space which could not be reduced to each other. There were two inequivalent classes of closed paths okay. and I said that this is ultimately what was responsible for the fact that you had single and double valued representations of the rotation group because we also saw that the second class of closed path could be shrunk to a point could be reduced to a trivial uh, transformation if you did two such closed paths in other words you did a rotation of 4 pi instead of 2 pi and I mentioned that all those representations of the rotation group which transformed such that when you went through a rotation of 2 pi you returned to the original state were called tensor representations and the others were called spinner representations. Today I want to show you very briefly in the beginning that you can transform you can uh, look at rotations not in terms of 3 by 3 matrices which would act on the x y z components in some frame of reference but rather as 2 by 2 matrices which satisfy a certain property of unitarity. So the connection that we want to establish is between the group of physical rotations of SO3 3 by 3 unimodular orthogonal matrices and SU2 which is the group of 2 by 2 matrices which are unitary and have determinant plus 1 and the way it goes is as follows you see instead of representing a point in space as a column vector so instead of taking an arbitrary point in three dimensional space so here is x here is y z I take an arbitrary point x y z and instead of representing it as x y z as a column vector in this fashion and calling it the position vector r it is possible to represent it in another way as a 2 by 2 matrix all we have to do is to replace r by r dot sigma where sigma is our old set of friends the Pauli matrices and this stands for a 2 by 2 matrix and its components are trivially written down from the known values of what the sigma matrices are and it is z minus z x minus i y x plus i y and now it is a trivial matter to verify that if you give me x y z I uniquely have this matrix if you give me r dot sigma I can work back and find what x y z are mm -hmm. this is trivial because as you can see immediately by structure of the matrix we have also pointed out that any 2 by 2 matrix can always be written uniquely in terms of the Pauli matrices and the unit matrix. So once you give me the components of the Pauli matrices once you give me r dot sigma I give you the vector r itself okay. So there is therefore a correspondence between the vectors r and the matrices r dot sigma. Now on this you would have a 3 by 3 element so G if it is an element of SO3 this is a 3 by 3 matrix and if it stands for a rotation about the unit vector n through an angle psi it is some 3 by 3 matrix and what you would end up getting is R goes under the rotation to R prime which is equal to this G acting on this column vector R. So this is a 3 by 3 matrix which acts on this column vector r and produces x prime y prime z prime okay. In exactly the same way there exists a 2 by 2 matrix which we will discover corresponding to this element g such that u that matrix 
acts on this 2 by 2 matrix with a u inverse here and this gives you r prime dot sigma. So therefore this 2 by 2 matrix u which we are going to discover is a representative of this rotation here and the question is what kind of relation is there between g and u okay. Once that is specified then I might as well represent rotations I might as well represent points in space by 2 by 2 matrices r dot sigma and rotations by u rather than g here and the task is to discover what are the properties of this matrix u what is the matrix u that corresponds to a rotation in SO3 okay. Obviously u would also be parameterized by these same numbers by theta phi and psi but what sort of matrix is it and it is a 2 by 2 matrix so that the result is still a 2 by 2 matrix here okay. So this is the mapping between one set of um, representations one representation one, one way of representing the rotations and another way of representing the rotations okay. These matrices U will turn out to be elements of 2 by 2 matrices the group of 2 by 2 matrices which are unitary and which have got determinant plus 1. The original ones were 3 by 3 matrices which were orthogonal and had determinant plus 1 and also the elements were all real all these elements were real there is no guarantee here that the elements are going to be real they would have e to the i phi and things like that sitting there. Hmm. So this is the pro program yeah yeah there is an advantage you will see what the advantage is the advantage is that the group SU2 is simply connected it is not doubly connected it is like a sphere and we will see what it is. Hmm. So instead of proving the formal correspondence let me motivate it by telling you how this geometrical construction can be done what one does is to say that you can make a, a mapping from the surface of a unit sphere in three dimensions to a plane by something called stereographic projection so let me specify three axes say xi eta and zeta and put a unit sphere center at the origin such that this is the equatorial plane that is the unit circle and let us call this plane the xy plane. So the x direction is along the zeta direction xi direction and the y direction is along the eta direction and this is the xy plane in fact it is a complex plane can make it the complex plane. Then what is stereographic projection it corresponds to taking the north pole here whose coordinates are 0 0 1 zeta and eta uh, xi and eta are 0 and zeta is 1 and then drawing a line from there to intersect the sphere at some point and then to go and intersect the plane at some point. And the point where it intersects the sphere is mapped onto this point on the plane and you can see that for every point on the sphere there is a point on the plane and vice versa this is stereographic projection. The north pole this point of projection is mapped onto the point at infinity the south pole is mapped onto the origin in the in the complex plane in the x plus i y plane the unit circle remains mapped to equator is mapped onto the unit circle and what are these maps well xi is equal to 2x over mod z squared plus 1 z let me call z equal to x plus i y that is my complex x uh, z plane here eta is equal to 2y over mod z squared plus 1 and zeta is equal to mod z squared minus 1 over mod z squared plus 1 I leave you to figure out the inverse maps okay and of course this is a unit circle so you always satisfy xi squared plus eta squared plus zeta squared 
equal to 1. So, you map this sphere, it is called the Riemann sphere, onto the complex plane by stereographic projection. This projection has many, many interesting properties. For example, it preserves, it maps circles on the sphere onto either circles or straight lines on the plane, because any latitude is clearly mapped onto a circle concentric with the origin, any longitude is mapped onto a straight line passing through the origin. And the point at infinity is mapped, the map of the point at infinity, the, of the point of projection is the point at infinity in the complex plane. Okay. Now, a rotation in physical three dimensional space would correspond to rotating the Riemann sphere. And what does it do on the plane is the question. It induces, of course, a transformation on the plane as well. And it is easy to check, and I am not going to prove this specifically, that if you rotate, in physical three dimensional space, if you rotate in the x y plane about the z axis, then the rotation matrix has a very simple form and what is that equal to? So, if for example, n equal to E z about this z axis and instead of psi equal to some angle gamma, I am imagining the third Euler angle gamma. So, I rotate in the x y plane about an angle gamma then it is clear that this element g element of S O 3 is given by cos gamma sin gamma 0 minus sin gamma it is given by that. Only the x and y coordinates change and the z does not. So, this is the matrix here. If you put that back here and ask what does that transformation correspond to a rotation in this plane about this z, uh, zeta axis, then it is easy to see that u is equal to e to the i gamma over 2, 0, 0, e to the minus i gamma over 2 and plus or minus that. Both plus and minus would do the trick because as you can see here, if you change the sign of u, nothing is going to happen. So, this element g, the counterpart of it in this other way of looking at rotations is in fact the pair of matrices here, this pair of matrices. Similarly, no transformation at all, no rotation at all would mean the identity matrix here for g, just 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 in the diagonals. And that would correspond to setting gamma equal to 0 here. So, it would be plus or minus the unit matrix in this language here and that is not going to change. You can see if I put the identity matrix or minus the identity matrix, I am going to retain just this same r dot sigma. Similarly, for rotation about the zeta axis, uh, the, the xi axis and the eta axis, they are a little more intricate, but one can write them down because you know how to write it down in this case. For instance, if there is a rotation about in the in the y z plane, then it is clear that the x thing would remain unchanged. It would be 1, 0, 0 and then a 0 and 0 here and these two guys would go like cos and sin and so on. And you can compute what it does correspondingly in u by those transformation rules. Then the question is, what kind of matrices do you have for u? And it turns out, that the matrices you have for u, the requirement that the matrices be of this form and that uh, the magnitude of r be preserved suffices to ensure that these matrices u must be unitary and unimodular. By unitary it means that the Hermitian conjugate is the inverse of the matrix. U u dagger is equal to the identity matrix. Okay. 
incidentally this also implies u dagger u it says u dagger is u inverse that is all. What does this kind of thing say orthogonal it says O transpose is O inverse whereas that says complex conjugate transpose is the inverse that is the difference between unitary and orthogonal. Orthogonal is what happens if the matrices have got real elements a unitary matrix with just real elements is orthogonal. Okay. So all 2 by 2 matrices which correspond to which, which satisfy these conditions would represent physical rotations in three dimensional space and it is an easy matter to put these conditions in start with the general matrix A B C D with possibly complex entries put in the requirement how many independent elements for a complex matrix with 2 by 2 matrix there are 4 elements each of them can be complex so you have 8 independent real parameters. Now you impose the condition that it should be unitary there are 4 conditions there and the determinant must be plus 1 is one more so it becomes 5 conditions and you end up with 3 parameters but 3 is precisely the number of parameters you have here to specify rotations 2 here and 1 here therefore it is very reasonable and plausible and provable exactly that in fact those are the correct matrices which would represent rotations but what is a general 2 by 2 unitary matrix going to look like if determinant plus 1 it is going to be of the form alpha some beta minus beta star alpha star that is what a general u would look like but the determinant must be plus 1 so it satisfies mod alpha squared plus mod beta squared equal to 1 okay. therefore these matrices the real and imaginary parts alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 beta 2 none of them can exceed 1 in magnitude because the sum of the mod squares of alpha and beta must be equal to 1 and written out in terms of components what does it mean therefore what is the parameter space of SU2 SU2 is parameterized by 4 real numbers alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 beta 2 satisfying the constraint the sum of the squares of all these 4 real numbers must be equal to 1 therefore it is a sphere in 4 dimensions the surface of a sphere embedded in 4 dimensions or S3 so the parameter space of SU2 the parameter space is S3 S3 is simply connected pi 1 of S3 is trivial is 0 on the other hand SO3 is not simply connected so what is the connection between these two guys well you have one group here is the set of all matrices in SU2 and here is a set of all matrices in SO3 for every rotation here a point here is a rotation with some n and some psi there are two SU2 matrices which differ by a sign so this gets mapped here and this gets mapped here some matrix u here gets mapped to some element g here and this is minus u and that gets mapped to the same element the unit element here this is the identity matrix here the unit element that is mapped by both the identity and minus the identity both these guys get mapped onto this. yes because it is an even dimension SU2 so the 2 minus 1s give you a plus 1 the determinant is still plus 1 not true if it were odd of course so that is the point so this implies 
that there is not a one to one mapping, but a two to one mapping. So, it is a two to one homomorphism Now, these two elements themselves which get mapped onto the unit uh, the identity element here these two elements are called the center of this group. And what one writes in technical terms is that SO3 is isomorphic to SO2 quotiented with Z2 because these two elements the unit 2 by 2 matrix and minus the unit 2 by 2 matrix themselves form a group under group of operation of multiplication because i times i is i minus i times minus i is i once again i times minus i is minus i. So, they form a group among themselves these two and it is just the set in the cyclic group of order 2 it is a group isomorphic to the set of integers under addition modulo 2. So, you could identify this i with all even integers minus i with all odd integers and the groups are identical it is the same z 2. So, one says that s u 2 quotiented with z 2 this is s o 3 the parameter space of this is s 3 and you do pi 1 of this guy s 3 is simply connected and you end up with z 2 alone which is pi 1 of s o 3. So, this is how one uses this uh, covering group this quantity this this group is called the universal covering group of S O 3 S U 2 is the universal every Lie group whose parameter space is not simply connected is guaranteed to have a universal covering group whose parameter space is simply connected and there is a homomorphism 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 or whatever n to 1 homomorphism between the covering group and the elements of the original and the original group. So, it is not an isomorphism, but a homomorphism in this you have the single valued all the value representations of this guy of S u 2 would include the single valued as well as the double valued representations of S O 3. So, really the fundamental group is S U 2 rather than O 3 because this is a bigger structure as you can see. Now, the interesting thing is we discovered these properties of the angular momentum eigenvalues and so on by just the algebra of the commutators. The fact is that every Lie group of this kind has an associated algebra of generators infinitesimal generators which trans which when exponentiated would give you the elements of these matrices just as I take an infinitesimal generator of rotations and exponentiate it I get a finite rotation that algebra is called the Lie algebra corresponding to the Lie group and the Lie algebras are exactly the same the Lie algebra of SU 2 which is written as SU 2 in small letters and S O 3 in small letters these are the Lie algebras the Lie algebras of the generators are exactly the same and each of them is just the angular momentum algebra. So, these two groups locally look similar locally. So, in a neighborhood of this G if you look at infinitesimally different rotations as compared to those of G the parameters of G you would get an infinitesimal neighborhood here as you would an infinitesimal neighborhood here. And if you looked only in this neighborhood or only in this neighborhood they would just look identical this neighborhood and that neighborhood would look identical. But globally the group structure is different from that group there because there is a 2 to 1 homomorphism. Okay. So, the Lie algebras of a group and its covering group are always the same but the group structure is different the global structure is different yeah. Yeah. 
four dimensions? Yes, for any s, yes, yes, of so course. For any dimension, uh, the group S O D in D dimensions, where D is three, four, five, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the covering group for it is called spin D. That's the covering group. Uh, spin three happens to be uh, S U two. Okay, for three dimensions. Otherwise, it's spin D. It's called the spin group. No, they are not. No, the next question is is the spin uh, for the higher dimensional for say 4, 5, etc. is it equal to uh, is SO is SO n's covering group S U D n minus 1? The answer is no. There are some special relations SU 4 occurs as a covering group later on, but not in general, it is just the spin group. So this, this is the point. Okay, our physical significance, the most important one in our present purposes, is SU2. So it's worth understanding SU2 very well. And SU2 has the advantage that it's simply connected, and every matrix in SU2 has that simple form, and you could easily represent it in terms of Pauli matrices. So you see why the Pauli matrices begin to play such a fundamental role uh, role in understanding quantum mechanics and spin and so on because it is really connected with the rotation group and not just spin half okay maybe a few exercises on this will help clarify some of these things let's now uh, go back to our physical problem of a particle in a spherically symmetrical potential we haven't done this we talked about bound states in one dimension we looked at potential problems in one dimension but we have not yet looked at the problem of a particle in a centrally symmetric spherically symmetric potential. So let us do that you have already solved the hydrogen atom problem in the chemistry course long ago let me try and justify what was done there and generalize this a little bit. So what is our task we would like to uh, look at motion in a central field. I have in mind a spinless particle I am not going to look at spin now which is moving in a central field of force like the Kepler problem. Now classically I know that in such a situation angular momentum about the origin or the center of force is conserved and that fact will remain true in quantum mechanics as well and what we need to know is what we need to find out is what does it imply for the energy levels of the system. So here is a problem where in addition to the Hamiltonian you are going to have other constants of the motion other operators which commute to the Hamiltonian and therefore simultaneous eigenstates can be formed and what is the consequence for the energy eigenvalues and eigenstates. So what is the Schrodinger equation minus h cross squared over 2 m del squared that is the kinetic energy part I am now writing it in the position basis and I am interested in stationary states in other words eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with specific energies E. The Hamiltonian is just P squared over 2 m plus a potential which is a function only of the radial coordinate R no theta no phi. Now just to recall what happened classical mechanics that P squared was the square of the linear momentum it could therefore be decomposed into the radial momentum and the angular momentum. So you could also write this classically as equal to classically P radial momentum squared over 2m plus angular momentum squared over 2m r squared that is the moment of inertia twice the moment of inertia plus a V of r. and we know it is easy to prove that L is a constant of the motion dl over dt was 0 or the Poisson bracket of L with the Hamiltonian was 0. Okay. Classically there was nothing to forbid you from simultaneously finding sharp values for Lx, Ly and Lz but quantum mechanically they do not commute with each other and therefore you cannot do that 
and quantum mechanically we expect we would be able to diagonalize any one component of L. So the Hamiltonian is exactly the same the definition of L remains unchanged L is R cross P R and P do not commute with each other the components of Cartesian components of R do not commute with the counterparts of P. On the other hand I write L as R cross P and R and P are Hermitian operators so should not I symmetrize this or something like that uh, yeah X i and P j commute with each other unless i equal to j and since in the cross product you never have a Cartesian component of the coordinate and the same component of the momentum this commutation problem is not there otherwise suppose that were not the case what should I have done. I should write r cross p minus p cross r and take it divide by 2 but I do not need to do that here. What would be the radial momentum by the way because classically I would have r p r equal to 1 and quantum mechanically that should translate to r p r equal to i h cross times the identity operator. Now my general rule is that in the position basis p goes to minus i h cross del right and this is fine for each Cartesian component but I have to be a little careful about the radial component. Normally classically I would define the radial component p r as simply r dot p divided by r itself it is the component of p along the radial direction unit vector along the radial direction is dotted with p to give me p r what should I do quantum mechanically these guys do not commute ah. classically p r classically is r over r dot p it is the component of p dotted with the unit vector in the radial direction that is my definition of the radial momentum but I could also have written this as p dot r over r there is no commutativity problem classically quantum mechanically what should I do which one should I choose. Well, you cannot choose either one of them because if you choose this or that it then you have trouble with hermeticity it should be Hermitian hmm? if you got a product a b the Hermitian conjugate is b a and if b and a do not commute with each other you are in trouble. So what should uh, the quantum mechanical thing be p r well p dot notice I cannot bring this r out here r over r plus r over r dot p that would be a good compromise but it should become Hermitian which this is so I need this plus sign and then I have to make a half here by doing this I ensure that p r is actually Hermitian as it should be so that the eigenvalues are real self adjoint actually more technically but this is guaranteed to give real eigenvalues. So that is the right way to write it. So what would the quantum operator be P Cartesian is minus i h cross delta over delta x i there is no problem with that but P r is not minus i h cross delta over delta r that will not satisfy this condition here. So it turns out that 1 over r delta over r r satisfies the conditions that you need you can work it out by putting p is minus h cross del there and actually working this out. So this becomes equal to minus i h cross delta over delta r plus 1 over 
that is the operator corresponding to the radial momentum. And then indeed quantum mechanically also one can write V of R in this form here, where P R in the position space has this representation. Okay. So, we have been careful, made sure it is actually Hermitian. Then what does a Schrodinger equation become? By the way, I am hoping, uh, I am assuming that you are familiar with the fact that the way you arrive at a particle moving in a central potential originally for physical problems is when you have two particles which experience a certain interaction which depends only on the distance between them, a central force and then you go to the center of mass coordinates, eliminate the center of mass and in relative coordinates you get a one body problem in a central potential. So, I am assuming this job has already been done. So, the Schrodinger equation now can be written down, it is just this acting on psi equal to i h cross delta psi over delta t and for stationary states which are eigenvalue functions of the Hamiltonian, then the time independent Schrodinger equation is del squared psi of some r, the wave function r. I use the symbol phi I believe, so let us let us stick to that, this is for stationary states plus V of r phi of r is E phi of r. This is the time independent for stationary states. That is the equation we have to solve. Hmm? Yeah. You write L square by PR. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good point. Extremely good point. This guy is an operator and this fellow is also an operator. But I have not bothered about is it 1 over R squared L squared or L squared times 1 over R squared. I should be careful. I was exceedingly careless there. Huh? Let us write it out in position, the position basis and see what happens explicitly. Huh? In the position basis, all we have to do is to take del squared and write it out. So, that is what p squared is, right. It is 1 over r squared delta over delta r, r squared delta over delta r plus 1 over r squared sin theta delta over delta theta there are not too many things worth memorizing but del squared and spherical polar coordinates is worth memorizing so otherwise you have to work it out each time it's a nuisance plus 1 over r squared sin squared theta delta 2 So, if I use this prescription, hmm, then it is clear that what I have is p squared goes to equal to minus h cross squared del squared. Hmm. And I am writing this as equal to p r squared plus l squared over r squared. That is what I have done here. So, what is L squared? We can identify L squared here in the position basis. It is quite clear from here that L squared is 1 over sin theta delta over delta theta sin theta delta over delta theta plus 1 over sin squared theta delta 2 over delta pi 2 that is L squared in the position basis written in spherical polar coordinates. So, now tell me why should not I bother about the order between little r and L squared? 
they have nothing to do with each other because they are independent coordinates this is entirely radial and that is got only the angular variables so they commute with each other therefore it does not matter whether I wrote this as L squared over R squared or 1 over R squared L squared or L squared times 1 over R squared it did not matter but one is right to be cautious one has to be careful. Now this equation suggests immediately that you can simplify it because this coefficient v of r which is what is the hard part you do not know it it is a general potential depends only on little r. So it at once suggests that you try to solve the problem by the method of separation of variables and then you have to use uniqueness theorems to show that that is a unique solution or if you get more than one solution for the same boundary conditions then you have to superpose all these solutions with appropriate normalized constants to get a physical solution. So the first step is to say let us put phi equal to and so far I have not said whether E is positive or negative or whatever it is only an energy eigenvalue so since the Hamiltonian is Hermitian you are guaranteed this E is a real constant and now what this value what values of E are physically acceptable depends on V of R it depends on the boundary conditions it depends on what you require of the solution okay. So the first step is to put phi equal to phi of R which is a function of R theta phi to put this equal to some R of R multiplied by an angular function which depends on theta and phi alone so some F of theta phi. substitute it in here use the fact that the radial part delta over delta r part acts only on capital R and the angular part the sin and the derivatives with respect to theta and phi act only on the f the function f. Now to cut a long story short we know that in this problem and this is true classically and quantum mechanically you know that L squared with h is 0 that is simple to prove that angular momentum is conserved in this problem. The only difficulty would have been if this fellow had dependent if this v of r had depended on other coordinates as well on the theta and phi that is not true here and L squared L z and h equal to 0 you could have chosen any component but I just choose the z axis because once I have chosen spherical polar coordinates I have singled out an axis the polar axis so let me quantize along that direction. So I have a situation where I have a set of three mutually commuting observables h l squared and l z therefore I expect that they have a common set of eigenvalues. I expect therefore that the eigenvalues would be labeled by the quantum numbers corresponding to these which label the states corresponding to these uh, the eigen eigenvalues of h l squared and l z I therefore expect three quantum numbers okay. Let me call them the radial quantum number the angular or momentum quantum number little l and little m. Now what sort of equation once you go through this rigmarole what sort of equation would this function f satisfy it has to be an angular momentum eigenstate and f is the only portion which carries the angles right. So the equation it would satisfy is precisely this L squared acting on this f must be equal to the angular momentum eigenvalues which would be this because we already know that the square of the angular momentum has eigenvalues h cross squared times L times L plus 1. So essentially these functions this function f would be labeled by the eigenvalues little l and little m. So what is the equation it would satisfy 
say this guy here acting on this function by now let me now write down the solution what it actually is it is conventionally denoted as y and it is labeled by L and M it is a function of theta and phi out here and this would be equal to L times L plus 1 y L m of theta and phi. Which m? This m did not appear suddenly it appears from the fact that we already have solved the angular momentum problem and I know that I have I am going to label my states as common eigenstates states of L squared and L z. So, in anticipation of that I put in this dependence that m is not the mass it is the magnetic quantum number okay. I must be careful with the sign uh, p squared has got a minus del squared. So, the minus of this is equal to this guy. So, I must have minus 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 of it. Okay. Now, the next thing to do is to assume that this y l m of theta and phi is a product of a function of theta and a function of phi again separation of variables and it is suggested by the form of that equation there immediately. So, let me write the solutions down since this is yes yeah because it will work because it will work you see I can almost predict what is going to happen imagine theta is a constant for a moment none of this is going to play a role there is d 2 over d phi 2 acting on a function equal to the same function there. So, it immediately suggests it is an exponential function in phi that is it. So, the phi dependence just an exponential e to the sum alpha phi or something like that right and d 2 over d phi 2 is just going to produce an alpha squared. And once they put that in then with that constant alpha squared the rest of it is going to obey the same equation. Okay. So, the solutions let me write the solutions down y l m of theta and phi are the following and then it becomes a standard equation once you separate out the phi part and require that it be single valued in phi which we already know that m must be an integer running from minus l to l then the equation that you get is called the differential equation satisfied by the associated Legendre polynomials and the actual solution looks like this y l m of theta and phi has got a normalization constant which I remember is 2 l plus 1 over 4 pi l minus m factorial over l plus m factorial. I hope there is no minus to the m somewhere uh, this is for remember that uh, minus l less than equal to m plus l and l itself 0 1 2 etc. At the moment this is all we know we do not know that it stops at some principal quantum number or n minus 1 or anything we do not know that we are just solving the angular part and that is just standard and solving the problem of the orbital angular moment. This is nothing to do with v of r we do not yet know what v of r is. So, this is the definition of y l m of theta and phi it is called a spherical harmonic. And incidentally uh, for m less than 0 because m can take on negative values as well you need a definition and that definition is y l m equal to minus 1 to the power mod m y l mod m star 
of theta phi. So it just differs by a phase factor and then that e to the i m phi becomes e to the minus i m phi the complex conjugate. These quantities these guys are the associated associated Legendre polynomials and they are tabulated they are derivatives of the Legendre polynomials themselves. So if you recall the definition P L M of X is equal to I should be a little careful here uh, There may be some normalization factors I've left out, but as I recall, it's the it's a derivative of uh, PL of x. PL of x itself is the ordinary Legendre polynomial. P zero of x is one. P one of x is P one of x is x. P two of x is half of three x squared minus one, and so on and so forth. So PL of x is has got parity minus one to the l. It's a polynomial of order l and it is got a normalization rule. So if you recall uh, equal to delta n l. So those factors have been put in here and you end up with a similar constraint a similar normalization condition here if you integrate this multiplied by its complex conjugate and you integrate over theta and phi over all solid angles then you would get a Kronecker delta and mm prime okay so i'm not going to bother to write it down in that case, but one can derive it fairly trivially. So these functions are all already normalized. They already form an orthonormal basis for the angular functions, angular part. The question is what happens to the radial part? Okay. Now notice that once you have taken care of this m dependence uh, of the phi dependence which came from here by that e to the i m phi then matters become very simple you can go back and ask what does it do for the radial equation itself what is the equation obeyed by capital R and then something very simple happens the equation obeyed by capital R is what we want to discover remember that I put phi equal to this times now it is y l m of theta and phi and I would like to know what is the equation obeyed by this. Now that equation will have the radial part which is the minus uh, h cross squared over 2 m 1 over r squared d 2 over d r 2 etc. But this part of del squared which involves d 2 over d r 2 has also a d over d r part and the disadvantage of that is that d over d r is not self adjoint d 2 over d r 2 is. So one would like to get rid of the first derivative always and this is done in standard in a standard form by saying let u of r equal to r, r of r and then you write the differential equation down for u. But before I do that let us go back and ask what is the equation obeyed by this uh, capital R. It was minus h cross squared over 2m 1 over r squared d over dr of r squared r 
that was the kinetic energy part plus V of R times R that came from the potential energy. Hmm? Pardon me? Oh, yes. This portion plus a V of R R and then there was a portion which came from the angular portion which was minus h cross squared over 2 m r squared and l squared, but l squared is minus h cross squared l times l plus 1 over r squared. This also acts on r this fashion equal to plus 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 because it was the angular momentum squared and I already took into account this minus sign that is equal to E phi E times R and the Y L M cancelled out on both sides. Now take a look at this equation if this potential V of R is finite everywhere then so should the wave function also be finite everywhere. So what is the boundary condition I require on this R especially R equal to 0 what should I expect should happen to this at R equal to 0 I expect it to be finite. So if I want to get rid of the first derivative term by putting a U of R here this is finite at the origin would which would imply that u of r must vanish at the origin. So the boundary condition I require is that they should vanish at the origin. Is there anything I require of the potential at the origin because remember that even though this looks like a one dimensional problem now there is a huge difference in the fact that little r runs from 0 to infinity rather than minus infinity to infinity. So 0 less than equal to r less than infinity that is very important. So I need to specify now some conditions at the origin as well as plus infinity whereas in a one dimensional problem on the line I just specified it at minus and plus infinity. Hmm. Now we got to be careful about the origin. Now for this equation it is a second order differential equation the most singular part is going to come from this 1 over r squared everywhere. So it is clear that this 1 over r squared is going to play a huge role near the origin and you do not want in a second order differential equation if you recall the Frobenius theory of differential equations second order differential equations you would like the singularities to be ordinary singularities you want this to be a Fuchsian equation only then would you have a respectable spectrum and so on and so forth. Now these statements can be made fairly rigorous but I do not want to get into the technicalities of differential equations here you do not want a singularity worse than 1 over r squared at the origin. So the assumption I am going to make we will relax this assumption and I will tell you what happens if you relax it is that limit as r goes to 0 r squared v of r is 0 in other words v of r does not have a singularity worse than 1 over r squared. You could ask what happens if v of r is exactly equal to 1 over r squared 1 over r squared that is the limiting case and we will come and look at it specially. So as long as v of r goes blows up if it blows up at the origin blows up no worse than 1 over r to the 2 minus epsilon I am okay. Pardon me. Finite yeah, exactly. If this limit is finite, that would imply that V of R goes like 1 over R squared near the origin, then this is a limiting case. It will turn out that if the strength of this 1 over R squared is some number alpha, for alpha less than a certain critical value, you would have respectable bound states. For greater than that, things would fall into the origin, there would be collapse. And if it goes like um, if that limit is infinite, if it is unbounded, namely V of R goes to 0. Uh, uh, blows up worse than 1 over r squared at the origin then there is collapse to the origin. 
So the 1 over r squared potential is the balance limiting case is the is the marginal case. On the other hand the potential which we are interested in the coulomb potential is 1 over r that is very safe already. So we will relax this and come back to this later. Now on the wave function I am going to put in the condition limit r tends to 0 u of r equal to 0. So that is my boundary condition at the lower end and at the upper end the boundary condition it should be it should be normalizable this whole thing should be normalizable. Now what is the normalization condition on phi it says integral mod phi squared dv should be finite that is all you need and after that we will fix the constant so that the thing comes out to be 1 okay, the multiplicative constant. Now the angular part is already normalized to 1 so this would imply that integral mod r squared less than infinity is it just dr is it just dr the dv has got a phase factor so it is r squared dr and integral 0 to infinity mod u squared dr less than infinity that is all you need here because r times r is in fact u by definition. So this sets our problem up this is the boundary conditions under which I am going to solve the equation for u are limit u goes to r goes to 0 u of r is 0 and u of r should go to infinity uh, should go to uh, should vanish at infinity sufficiently fast that this integral is finite. Please notice that this requires this requires for bound states I want this normalization this requires that u goes to 0 as r tends to infinity sufficiently rapidly for bound states for normalizable solutions. Now what is the equation for u itself let me write that down and then we will take it up from here tomorrow morning the equation for u itself is d2 u over dr2 the first order term has gone away plus 2 m over h cross squared I bring the e to this side minus v of r I bring it over to this side minus l times l plus 1 h cross squared over 2 of r squared on u equal to 0. that is the second order equation obeyed by u. But it is showing us something very very interesting again I recall uh, I, I, uh, I call your attention to the fact that it is 0 less than infinity this is this is important it is like a one sided problem not a full one dimensional problem but a one sided problem with a barrier at the origin because I want to put this boundary condition u of r equal to 0 that would be the case in a one dimensional problem if I put an infinite barrier at the origin then the potential the wave function is 0 at the origin. So it is like saying I have a potential on a line minus infinity to infinity the physical region is 0 to infinity but I have an infinite barrier at r equal to 0 no negative r allowed and what is the effective potential. it is a function of r it is the actual physical potential plus l times l plus 1 h cross squared over 2 m r squared. So it is as if there is an extra potential due to the orbital angular momentum of the particle and that is called the centrifugal barrier because this potential as you can see it is a 1 over r squared with a positive sign and therefore it is always a repulsive potential. So if I have a potential here is r here is v of r if this potential was some nice bound state kind of potential suppose this was the potential then I would expect some bound states inside here 
now with the advent of this extra term here which blows up at the origin at l equal to 0 this is not there at all this is what would happen in the ground state. But for higher excited states when l is not 0 that offers a repulsive potential and therefore this potential would start looking like this the effective potential would start looking like this. With increasing l it becomes shallower and the minimum shifts to the right this is exactly the classical counterpart of the fact that when you have a bound state when you have an orbit the higher the angular momentum the further the orbit is okay. and that is precisely what is happening and the potential is getting weaker it is getting less and less strongly bound it is getting more, more and more weakly bound and that is exactly what increasing L would mean. Hmm. Now you begin to see why the 1 over r squared potential is so critical it depends on the relative signs of this and that okay. because if you had a 1 over r squared potential depending on what the L value is you may or may not be able to support a bound state it may fall into the origin or it may get kicked out completely. So that is why the 1 over r squared behavior of this near the origin is like a kind of a marginal case it divides two classes of potentials. So I will stop here and we will take it up from this point we will try to solve this for various cases I will not explicitly write down the solution because this involves special functions of various kinds but I will point out what happens if you have for example a free particle or a harmonic oscillator 3D oscillator or in the Kepler problem and what is special about the Kepler and oscillator potentials and then it brings us to the idea of degeneracy. So we will take this up tomorrow. Thank you.